Ah, yes. The Game Boy Advance. Ah, so many memories of a, of a handheld that I never really owned. I had a friend who owned one, and I played it a bit, and it was amazing. I remember playing Circle of the Moon. I remember playing, uh, I remember playing uh, like several Super Mario games on there. And great handheld. Great handheld. It's one of it, it's one of the better handhelds that like everyone talks about. But I never pers I don't have a personal connection to one uh, because handhelds. I sort of moved out of that market after I did the Game Boy Color. I did the Game Boy Color and I loved it so much. It was one of my favorite uh, my favorite things ever. And I know that I missed out on a lot, but I don't know. Maybe I'll go back and maybe I'll I'll get myself a Game Boy Advance. Uh, maybe I'll get me like, uh, cause of course there's the Game Boy, uh, I forget what the Game Boy Advance, uh, like SP, I think the one that has the clamshell, uh, which a lot of people say is the perfect, uh, a lot of people say is the perfect, uh, the perfect handheld. There's a lot, like, there's a lot of people out there who stand by that, you know, end over end is like, it's the best handheld of all time. And the only drawback is that it doesn't have a uh, doesn't have a headphone jack, but you can get an adapter to plug into the bottom where the charging port is, and that can act as headphones. But it means you can't charge it, which that's the only drawback. But everyone else says that because of its backlit screen, because of its rechargeable battery, because of how easy it is to just like, because of the clamshell like design and just. It, everyone says it's just perfect. And I think that it is... It's up there. It is definitely one of the better... It's one of the better ones... Because I've held a few. I held Ben's whenever he showed me his. And then, of course, there was also... Uh, there was also uh, Keith. Keith uh, showed me his Game Boy SP. And I, I, I held it. I was like, damn. This thing's like really well put together. And he swore this. He said, Nate... I have not plugged a charger in on this in like 10 years. I want you to open it up and hit the power button. I opened it up, I hit the power button, and it turned on, and it still had like over 70% battery. Like, that's unbelievable. I, I <laughs> And I, I do believe him, because Keith's never been one to like pull the wool over my eyes or anything like that, but Keith is like one of like the most die-hard, old-school uh, Game Boy fans out there, and he he loves all stuff like that. <sighs> he's also he's also quite the exploiter in terms of uh, in terms of like certain console exploits. Can't go into too much detail because potential legal trouble. But anyway, yeah, Game Boy Advance, power to the pocket. So I really really enjoy watching Scott talk about uh, old school stuff. I know that there's a lot of people out there who would say, who would say, hey, what about, uh, you know, Scott talking about uh, the, the Switch and stuff like that? You know, his yearly updates on Switch. I think he's up to year, I don't know what year it is right now for, I think it's year six. And those videos each are like an hour and a half long. Ugh. So... I guess we're going to go ahead and get back into, like, watching this here. This is the Game Boy Advance Power to the Pocket by Scott the Waz. Actually, hold on a second. Real quick. I need to I need to check on one little thing before we start. Just as a little, as a little bit of a thing here. Let me see. Let's see. Game Boy. Nope. Nope, have not done a video on this. So uh, let's, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and go into it. So here we go. This is Scott the Waz with Game Boy Advance Power to the Pocket. Let's, uh, oh boy. What is it this time? Is this Cade again? Is, is this K Oh. Uh, oh boy. It's more stuff. It's, sorry. It's more stuff involving Kate. Okay, now that that's out of the way, now that that's all, this is all out of the way, let's get into this. Here we go. Oh, might help if I actually put it up on screen. There we go. 
Hey y'all, Scott here. Hi, so Scott. I was just working on my definitive list of Nintendo consoles with microphones on them. Yeah, the Game Boy Advance didn't make the list. That's actually a good thing. It's fairly annoying to have to blow into the microphone or something for a game. But I actually found a loophole with some Nintendo systems where you don't actually have to blow into the mic. So all I have to do is grab your system, grab an air horn, bring it close. Your entire life you've come to expect this, but then Nintendo decides to throw this at you. Oh f the letters are evolving! This is the Game Boy Advance, the last survivor of the Game Boy line, starting with the Game Boy in 1989, upgrading to the Game Boy Color in 1998, and finally reaching the final evolution, the GBA in 2001. And after everything was said and done, I think it's fair to say they ended the line on a high note. The Game Boy Advance was pretty much the ultimate. Sorry about that, everybody. It was a little bit of a phone call there, and uh, just had to deal with that. Anyway, back to this. Ultimate Game Boy. Most of the models played all previous Game Boy games. The GBA's own game library was seemingly endless, and certain revisions introduced features that we may take for granted today, but back then it was like, whoa, the Game Boy folds? This was the first system yeah. I owned brand new that wasn't a hand-me-down, and I hold it close to my heart. And it all started back in the mid-90s. The original Game Boy was starting to lose steam. I mean, bless Nintendo's heart. They were able to make this thing last over a decade, but at some point you just gotta look at Game yeah. Boy Mortal Kombat and say it's time to move on. This original black and white chunk of a portable was aging rapidly, and Nintendo wanted to create a new handheld that was far more powerful. Enter Project Atlantis. This was an ambitious planned successor to the original Game Boy. With 32-bit hardware, a larger screen, battery life of up to 30 hours, this was 1995. My 3DS doesn't even last five hours playing Wario's Woods. Rumors and reports consistently were yeah. floating around about Atlantis. And Nintendo did confirm its existence back in the day and originally planned to release it in 1996 before delaying it into obscurity and then just simply shelving the idea. Atlantis was simply far ahead of its time. The system was proving to be too expensive to manufacture and too large for Nintendo's liking. They opted to release revisions and upgrades to the original Game Boy instead to keep interest up. We got the Game Boy Pocket in 1996, the Game Boy Light, a Game Boy with a backlight in 1998 only in Japan, and the Game Boy Color also in 1998. Yeah. You will find me dead in the ground before I admit the Game Boy Color was simply an upgrade to the original model. I've always considered considered the color to be its own system, the first true successor two. to the Game Boy. It just had so many exclusive games. But it turns out Nintendo just looked at it as more of a souped up Game Boy rather than a true successor. Oh, Think the boy. Nintendo DSi to the DS, or the new 3DS to the 3DS. Because of that, a true next generation Game Boy was still being thought of. And while it didn't end up being Project Atlantis, a few of the core ideas that made up that project were incorporated into this new one, mm. codenamed Advanced Game Boy. Oh, I wonder what the final name will be. Initially announced in September of 1999 and fully unveiled at Nintendo's Space World event on August 24th, 2000, the Game Boy Advance was the most radically different is. looking Game Boy yet. It's long. Oh, and I can play Mario Kart. <laughs> this was the main game Nintendo was flaunting Mario with the GBA Kart during Advance. its unveil. It was always really cool for me to see what used to be home console only series finally making the jump to portable systems. So to have a Mario Kart playable on the go was honestly amazing and easily showcased how powerful this system was at the time. The rest of the GBA titles at Space World during this unveil were just Silent Hill for Game Boy Advance. Was I the only one to not know they made a remake of Silent Hill 1 in the form of a visual novel for the Game Boy Advance as a launch title? I did not know that. Was I? Konami was a big supporter for the system at the event, showing off a new Castlevania and Konami Crazy Racer. Sh Circle of the Moon. I know a lot of people don't, like, a lot of people like shit on that one because I think that's one of the ones where Igarashi is not evolved at all. Uh, hold on. Let me, let me make sure of that. So, hold on. Before I, before I make an ass of myself, hold on. Castlevania... Circle of the Moon. There it is. Castlevania Circle of the Moon. Yeah. Yeah, Igarashi's not there. Let's see. Yeah, Koji Igarashi. A move which uh, were retconned by former... The events of its plot were retconned by former Castlevania producer Koji Igarashi. It's because he wasn't involved with it. That's why. Igarashi is a very, very proud individual who just doesn't like when other people work on his things, which, yeah, I, I don't know, I just, eh. let's see, Bloodstain, and now he's doing the Bloodstain series, and a lot of people are really, a lot of people really like, uh, blood, uh, Bloodstain, see, Circle of the Moon, Sir, uh, Ritual of the Night, yeah, it's, 
it's unfortunate that Koji Igarashi retcon Circle of the Moon because Circle of the Moon is really, really good. It's one of the it's one of the games I played on it. My friend had it. And it's one of the games I played, and holy crap, it is really, really good. And no, I'm not holding a and no, I'm not holding like a a special place in my heart for it because, you know, the main character's name is Nathaniel. Shut up. Sure, I can deal with this existing. Mega Man Battle Network, Advance Wars, and Golden Sun were also shown yeah. off at Space okay. World, yeah. with the GBA's <laughs> launch price announced to be $100. It launched in Japan on March 21st, 2001, here in North America on June 11th, and in Europe on June 22nd. The purple Game Boy Advance was the one I owned, and compared to previous Game Boys, Nintendo definitely decided to widen things out with this model. You know what, compared to the regular format of Game Boy systems up to this point, the original Game Boy Advance is really comfortable, and being in this landscape form factor, yeah. in my opinion, balances this whole thing out a lot better than Old Ham Taro Player over there. Unlike the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, the Advance has two whole shoulder buttons, that's it, that's why they called it the Advance. Yeah, you'd think they would have given this thing four <laughs> face buns as well, but it's whatever, I can take just the shoulder buttons, they're a fine addition. I like how fat and long the shoulder buttons are. It makes them so much more comfortable than every other Nintendo handheld with shoulder buttons. And I do like all the buttons here in general. Everything has a nice, softer plastic feel while still feeling incredibly sturdy. This still takes batteries, two double A's, and the screen... What the hell am I looking at? Yeah, this was the biggest no drawback of the Game Boy Advance. The screen didn't have a backlight, front light, nothing. It was completely dependent on the lighting around you, and even in the best possible conditions, it was still hard to see the screen. It was never a huge issue, but it was always something that was less than desirable. There's something yeah, I can look it... back at now and say, oh my god, I put up with this? That's when you have to break out yeah. the accessories. I'm pretty sure some people built empires out of the uh, Game Boy Advance light business. Here yeah. we have warm light. Just gotta plug it into this port and blam, I can finally see what I was playing. Oh my god. Like I said, the screen was tolerable, but the Sega Game Gear back in 1990 had a backlight. The Atari Lynx had one in 1989. And it's because of that backlight, though, that those consoles, or those handhelds, failed. I hate to say it, but that's the God's honest truth. The reason why those failed is because low battery life, having to buy constant back... Because I had a Game Gear. I had a cousin that handed me down to Game Gear... And I could not keep the batteries... Like, I could not keep a charge on that thing to save my life. See, the Game Boy could... Like, you could play the Game Boy to and fro where you were going, and it would still have enough battery for another trip. Whereas me, I took my Game Gear, and I had like a 12-pack of batteries. Dude, by the end of that trip, the 12-pack of batteries had ran out, and my, my, cons, or my handheld had been dead for like... Two hours. That's why they. That's why it failed. How Nintendo made the Game Boy Light a few years earlier, with the entire selling point being the backlight. So the fact that this advanced Game Boy didn't have one was kind of ridiculous, let's be honest here. Game cartridges were half the size of traditional Game Boy games, yet they packed a way bigger punch. You could still play Game Boy and Game Boy Color games here with the trusty shoulder buttons commanding the video to go widescreen or go back to the aspect ratio God intended. Now all of this is great, yeah. but... Still, that screen, man, it honestly keeps the GB away from reaching pure greatness. Well, only two years later, in 2003, the Game Boy Advance SP released a full redesign with features that have become Nintendo's <coughs> staples ever since. A lit screen, a clamshell design to protect the screen and become even smaller, and a rechargeable battery. The SP stood for special, and they weren't kidding. I'd consider this to be one of the most important console releases in Nintendo history. This is honestly what I think of when I hear GBA. Yeah. It's so compact and the screen actually being usable makes a huge difference, who would have thought? Now this wasn't a big problem back in the day, but I do find the smaller size of the SP to be less comfortable than the original. These are Tic Tac shoulder buttons, everything feels a bit better with the old one. Nothing's outright bad here, but I do think the original had a perfect balance of being compact, yet comfortable for big and small hands alike. That's not to say the SP isn't comfortable to play, but just in comparison to the original, I think that one's better. And while we're whining about the SP, let me just get this one out of the way. Where's the headphone jack? To save space and money yeah. on this unit, Nintendo didn't include a headphone jack. You had to buy an adapter that goes into the charging port. This was honestly never something I thought of as a kid, but I can assure you it annoyed at least one person out there. Plus, if you use the adapter, you can't charge the Game Boy while using headphones. This isn't yeah. a modern smartphone, this is a Game Boy, damn it. Other than those little complaints, the SP is the definitive 
alternative Game Boy. I had the flame red color and I sunk so much time to this thing. They could play old Game Boy games, new ones too, finally with a screen you can actually see, a rechargeable battery, a stupidly compact design, and Nintendo said f*** it, we made it better. When you look into buying a Game Boy Advance SP nowadays, you may see people specify what model number they have, AGS-001 or AGS-101. The main difference is the quality of the screen's light. 101 has a full backlight and it is a huge upgrade. This thing yeah. is leagues better. The original SP did the job and is perfectly usable, but this, this is even- Oh, that's pretty. That is beautiful. And I, I agree, yeah, the 101, I, I think it was Keith that pointed it out to me, like, his is a 101, and the backlight on it is just tremendous. Oh. More usable. That's the only difference between these models, the quality yeah. of the screen brightness. You can definitely get by with an AGS-001, but if you don't want to be a fucking loser, then yeah, the 101 is for you. The Game Boy Advance line up to this point was a tremendous success. This was fundamentally how Nintendo made most of their money during the GameCube era. They sold nearly 80 million units of these systems combined. But when 2004 came around, Nintendo released the Nintendo DS for some reason. This was weird because they made it clear this was no replacement for the GBA, rather it was another pillar for their handheld business. Was bullshit. Hate to say it, but anytime you hear Nintendo say some bullshit like that, you, you really just gotta be like, mm-mm. Is that some kind of joke? It ultimately was the replacement for the GBA, and yes. they didn't want to say that because that would kill the GBA's sales, plus the DS was a risky move at the time, so if it failed, they could just keep supporting the advance. I never really got the whole, it's not a replacement shtick, because they said the DS was backwards compatible with the GBA. Yeah, exactly. Implying, you know, it was the successor. But releasing the DS in 2004, that was odd. The GBA was such a successful system, and after only three years, they release a new handheld? Games continued to come out for the Game Boy Advance after that point. It didn't mark the end of the system, but still. After the DS release, Nintendo wasn't finished with new Game Boy models. We got one final Game Boy Advance revision, which was also the final oh, Game the Boy in general. This was a giant failure. The Game Boy Micro released in 2005 to two and a half million lifetime sales and getting discontinued uh. three years later. See, Keith has one of those. He has like, I forget which, I think it's the red one, the red and, uh, red and gold one. And the thing is actually not bad. It's, it's not something, it's not anything special, but it's actually, it's actually all right. This was in the era Nintendo was kind of trying to mimic Apple. The DS and Wii's marketing always gave me iPod vibes. And the Game Boy Micro sort of felt like their take on something like the iPod Nano. A budget gaming device all about looks and being tiny. The Micro removed Game Boy and Game Boy Color support, which makes it far less useful than the SP. You see, that's where it lost me. Backwards compatibility, especially for someone who has a massive backlog of games. For instance, I... I I, I love, like, the PlayStation 2 because the backwards compatibility on it is is amazing. You can play PS1 games and they look even better. And not only that, but uh, not only that, but it's a CD player, it's a DVD player. It, it has all these functions. And then once you get into the PS3, it's just like, oh, so the only ones that are backwards compatible are the original the ones with the four ports on the front. Yeah. That's... Uh, that's not good. Yeah, that's, that's the version that Keith's got. It doesn't work with certain accessories, and its small size can definitely be annoying to some. This is a tiny thing. It almost needs to be seen to be believed. I didn't realize how small the micro was until holding one for myself, and I hate to admit, but I fell in love with this thing. The really? Game Boy Micro is one of the most beautiful devices Nintendo's ever created. The screen is absolutely gorgeous, a bit better than the SP-101, actually. It can only play Game Boy Advance games, which is kind of a bummer, but yeah. the library is so big that it doesn't matter that much. This uh, is definitely more of a novelty rather than a definitive way to play Game Boy games, hey, but Reggie. if you can find it for a cheap price, go for it. This is the Famicom Special Edition, made in commemoration of the system's 20th anniversary, but a key oh, attribute okay. of the Micro was swappable faceplates to make your own special edition. It had a lot of cool ideas, but this was definitely not a necessary revision of the Advance. 
With a launch price of 100 bucks in 2005, it was simply too pricey. It was a far less functional Game Boy Advance coming out after the DS release for $150. That could also play GBA games, and you could find an SP for much cheaper which could play all the Game Boy games in the world, so this was more of a device you'd buy to make some kind of a fashion statement rather than to just play some games. It may have failed and may be sort of worthless compared to the SP, but I love this thing, it's so cool. I personally think each of the GBA models have strengths compared to each other. The original is the most comfortable, the SP gives you a lit screen, clamshell design, and rechargeable battery, and the micro is the sleekest and coolest looking. But I think it's pretty obvious, if you had to get one, it would have to be the SP-101 model. While the yeah. micro has a slightly better screen, this can play all Game Boy games, the screen is already great and is cheaper than the micro. And the screen is much bigger than what's on the micro. Now why would you buy a Game Boy Advance today? Because this thing has an amazing library of games. Over 1,500 titles, yeah. 1,400 of them being re-releases. Yeah, that was oh. definitely a trend with the Game Boy Advance. Old games thrown onto the system. Maybe with a few tweaks here and there, some additions, some alterations. But hey, back then, this was awesome. It was great to be able to play a lot of these legendary games portably. But looking at the first party lineup now, I have to admit, it's a bit disappointing. Sure, good games yeah. are still good games, regardless of if they're ports. Albeit if they're good ports. Back in 2002, I had no idea Yoshi's Island on the GBA was an old game, and I'm sure other people who grew up with a re-release of a game didn't think of it as an old game, it was just... a game. And for the people who played these games on the original systems, it was still pretty cool to be able to play these things portably for the first time ever. However, it does make the Game Boy Advance lack a bit of its own image, and there were simply so many ports and remakes from Nintendo and other companies as well, that now I kind of look at the system as just a portable Super Nintendo and not much else. Because that's where a lot of its yeah, most memorable fair. games came from. A good chunk of Nintendo's main series all got remakes or ports, plus one original title. But weirdly enough, the Mario series was an exception. Anybody else find it odd that there was not a single traditional original Mario game on the GBA? There were a lot of Mario games, no doubt, but no traditional platformer. Yeah. Instead, we got the Super Mario Advance series. Yeah, those are the ones that I played. And yeah, they're more re they're more remakes and rebuilds than like fresh new IPs. Yeah, I never thought about that. That's actually kind of true. Huh. These were four remakes of 2D Mario titles. Super Mario Advance was a remake of Super Mario Bros. 2 USA, followed up by Super Mario World, Super Mario Advance 2, Yoshi's Island, Super Mario Advance 3, and Super Mario Advance 4, Super Mario Bros. 3. These names may That is confusing as hell. Why? Super Mario... Uh, just call it Super... Like, Super Mario World Advanced Edition, or... Yoshi's Island, Yoshi's Island Advanced, or uh, instead of just this long ass drawn out bullshit. Make me queasy, and I also don't know why they felt the need to shuffle all the games out of chronological order like that. These remakes were pretty solid though. Some of them took versions of these games from Super Mario All-Stars on the Super Nintendo and squished them onto a yeah, GBA cartridge. That. Adding stuff like cutscenes and new sound effects yeah. while also changing a few things here and there. Really Mario cool. Advance 1 and 4 are easily the most unique. Uh, Mario World and Yoshi's Island are pretty similar to the original games. I hear people cry about the Yoshi's Island port all the time screaming it's just not the same. I personally always felt like people were a bit too picky with that. Like sure, the SNES version is definitely the better version, yes. but the GBA release is perfectly fine, like it's still Yoshi's Island, it's just not as nice graphically. Advance 4 was a remake of Mario 3 and it is easily the coolest one of the bunch. They added a ton of stuff, and they changed loads of animations and graphics amongst all the advanced games to make them less dated and weird. Like, the scene in Mario 3 always made me fidget in my seat. Here in Advance 4, it looks much more natural. All the yeah. Mario Advance games came with a remake of the original Mario Bros. arcade game, and I love this thing. This oh. is the best version of Mario Bros. in my opinion. The physics are actually tolerable in this version. Main problem with remakes on the GBA, though? Screen crunch. These uh, games weren't made yeah. for a display this tiny, so they had to zoom in the view a bit, which ends up cutting some things off the screen and leads to you running into enemies you couldn't see or not being able to see as much ahead of you. It is a bit annoying, but it can be dealt with. That sadly does make some of these remakes not as good as the originals by default, when if it wasn't for the screen crunch, they'd potentially be the definitive versions. While these remakes yeah. helped supply enough Mario content for GBA players, it was still odd to me that they didn't have an original Mario platformer. Instead, we got a whole lot of side games. Mario vs. Donkey Kong 
was a puzzle platform yeah, that was pretty with much another Mario's. Donkey Kong 94 from the original Game Boy. That game was amazing, and this one is also pretty great. You just control Mario going through all these puzzle rooms with loads of acrobatics and keys. This was the introduction of the mini Mario toys, where they then took over the Mario vs. Donkey Kong series with the second game, and we never oh, got to see yeah. this style again. Man, nothing screams. Well, actually, they just announced another one, and I think that that's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool that they announced another one, and boom, now we're getting another Donkey Kong vs. Mario. Weird kid on the bus playing Game Boy Advance more than Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. Yeah, the okay, first... that's another one. This was one that I thought was really good. I thought it was just as I thought it was. I thought it was really good, and I know that this is seen as like a like a spiritual successor to uh, Mario uh, and the um, Super Mario RPG on the SNES. And yeah, it is, but it's its own thing. I like I, I play. I remember I played the first one and I played the second one. I never finished the second one, but yeah, the, these games were actually really good. Just in the Mario and Luigi series of RPGs, and potentially the best one. This was the main entry I got into, and yeah, it's definitely a fun one. A wacky RPG where you control both Mario and Luigi, and it also included the Mario Brothers arcade game. Well, now I've got to say this is the best game of all time. Uh, Not all the Mario Game Boy Advance games were winners, though. Care for uh, some Mario Pinball Land? This was weird. They had to structurally reform Mario from the inside out to even get this concept to work. It's okay, I guess. It's just kind of annoying to play for me. At least physics never felt like the most right thing in the world to me. Two series that finally made their way onto portable systems with the GBA yeah, were Mario, Mario Kart, Kart and Super Mario Circuit. Party. Mario Kart Super Circuit was an original Mario Kart, but included the entirety of Super Mario Kart's tracks as well, which makes sense because Super Circuit is the most similar to Super Mario Kart. The characters <laughs> kind of look like how they did in Mario Kart 64, but everything else is pretty Super Mario Karty. It's yeah. a decent enough portable Mario Kart for the time, and just nothing really worth going back to now. Mm -hmm. Mario Party Advance, yeah. I never played, but can you really blame me? It's Mario Party Advance. Camelot made the Mario Tennis and Mario Golf games for the system as they usually do, but they also worked on their own RPGs for the Game Boy Golden Advance. Sun, the Golden yeah. Sun game. I know I've heard Keith talk about Golden Sun. He lo he loves Golden Sun. Games. Golden Sun's a pretty traditional RPG, but with graphics like these, it really stood out on the system. Of course, blown up on a big display, they look kind of rough, but on the original screen, they looked stellar. Yeah, this was a solid game on the system, and that's coming from your local RPG hate and fling smash owner. Nintendo put out a lot of stuff on this thing we hadn't seen prior here in North America. The GBA was the first time Fire Emblem and Advance Wars left Japan. That was huge! Huh. These series have been going on since the Famicom, so to finally get them in the States was awesome. Sure, we did get a Fire Emblem anime on VHS here in North America, America in 1997, but does that really count? Metroid got two uh, games, Metroid Fusion in 2002 and a remake of Metroid 1, Metroid Zero Mission in 2004. Two fantastic Metroid experiences. A new original game in the definitive way to play the first one. Fusion is considered Metroid 4 and is just a good 2D Metroid game. The last original 2D Metroid game for like decades, but hey, at least we got Zero Mission as well. A very... Uh, I know that this... Uh, okay. Yeah, this is before Dread. I remember Scott's reaction to Dread. Holy cow. I mean, it was worth it. Necessary update to Metroid 1. Zelda had a similar presence. We got a port of Link to the Past featuring a new multiplayer side mode, Four Swords, which later was expanded into its own game on the GameCube, Four Swords Adventures. Yeah. But the big one was the Mish Cap, Cap, developed yeah. by Capcom. This is such a great Zelda game. It's just pure top-down Zelda fun. You have a talking hat. I made it clear that, hey, I love what I play of the Zelda games, but I barely finish them. I'm making an oath right now, though, that I will finish the Minish Cap. I did not beat the Minish Cap. I admitted the Game Boy Color was simply an upgrade. Come on, dude. Kirby's Nightmare in Dreamland was a great remake of Kirby's Adventure, and Kirby in the Amazing Mirror was a neat little multiplayer-focused Kirby game. It's actually one of the most unique mainline Kirby games out there. Wario actually took over from Mario in terms of original platformers. We got Wario Land 4! The Wario Land series always weirded me out. Like, it started with the third Mario Land game, it became its own series, and really plays nothing like a Mario game. Which I'm fine with, it's just weird that it all started out with a game titled Mario Land 3. 
which is the same as the Yoshi series, starting with a game called Mario World 2. The Sonic Advance series was one weird. of the best things THQ's ever published. It was a fun modernization of 2D Sonic. I still prefer the original classic style, but this was great for the time, and I'd love to see something like this return. The Castlevania GBA games, oh my god. These were amazing handheld entries in the series following the success of Symphony of the Night. I played the first one, Circle of the Moon, and it is so good. Just yeah. exploring this giant map, finding upgrades to lead to more areas, it's what you'd want and expect out of a post-Symphony of the Night Castlevania game. Mega Man games were everywhere, especially Battle Network. Ba oh, this yeah. was a complete departure from standard. The amount of times I heard Ben talk about Battle Network, oh my god. And him playing them on stream, that was actually pretty cool. Your Mega Man, it's a side series, tactical RPGs. They made six. I've heard some of these games were quite good, although they definitely made too many of them. There were the Mega Man Zero games, definitely more in line with what we'd expect from Mega Man. And who could forget Mega Man and Base, a Super Famicom game that left Japan for the first time on the GBA. It wasn't good. But hey, we oh. actually got F-Zero games on this thing. Can you believe it? Pokemon happened here, of yeah. course. We got a new generation with Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald alongside remakes of the first generation, Fire Red and Leaf Green. But you know me, I'm not big into Pokemon. I think I figured out why though. You see, I didn't grow up with it and I feel like Pokemon just isn't easy to get into if you didn't grow up with it. That's but the true. GBA was how millions experienced Pokemon for the first time. And that can't be undervalued. But of course, like I said, the Game Boy Advance was a re-release fiend. The Donkey Kong Country series, Contra 3, Final Fantasy, Street Fighter, Fantasy Star, Namco Museum, Doom, Earthworm Jim, Mega Man and Base, oh Jesus, Sonic Genesis, oh f There was also the classic NES series, a bunch of old NES games released as cartridges for 20 bucks a pop. I love the packaging here, and yeah. the cartridges are even colored to look more like NES games. But some of these titles just were not worth that much money. Japan got cooler uh. boxes though, with tiny replicas of Famicom boxes and neat outer plastic shells. Like I said, the amount of ports is a bit disappointing, but they at least mean the GBA had a rock solid library. Sure, the DS and 3DS probably had more original new titles from Nintendo and major third parties, but the GBA's library at the time was phenomenal. The fact you could play all these amazing games portably was mind blowing, and it had yeah. some great original new games on top of that. Like Drill Dozer, when Game Freak had some free time between making Pokemon games, they pumped this thing out. You have a giant drill, it's good. It even had Rumble implanted into the cartridge. They had a few of these tumor carts. There was Yoshi Topsy Turvy with a tilt sensor, nobody needs this. But WarioWare Twisted had a gyroscope. This is still considered as one of the best WarioWare games to many, and hey. WarioWare started on the GBA. I are. adore WarioWare. Quick bite-sized micro games getting flung at you at lightning speed. It's so great and the Advance got two of them. While its library may have been a bit been there done that heavy, there was still a little bit of something for everyone on the GBA. It was fairly powerful enough to do things that still impress me. Loads of games still look good to this day. While it was obvious it primarily exceeded at 2D games, seeing 3D stuff run in the system was pretty crazy back then and still impressive now and it could play episodes of Sonic X, Game Boy Advance video, oh, cartridges yeah. that contained episodes of TV shows with a few movie releases. I owned a few of these back then, and it was pretty cool to watch Nickelodeon shows on my Game Boy. Wow. <laughs> okay. Rocket power. Holy crap. You're talking about a, you're talking about like a, a like a time capsule of the 90s. Holy crap. I guess these were made to compete with the portable media craze with iPods, portable DVD players, and the video now. I love this thing. Watching these cartridges now? Well, it could be worse. Oh yeah, it definitely could. The e-reader! No, this was an accessory, no. alright. Nintendo created this thing to scan oh, cards that contained code. Swipe a card, the e-reader would read the code, and you would unlock certain things in games, or swipe a bunch of these NES cards and play old school NES games. Yes, if you needed more of a reason to believe the classic NES series was overpriced, here are some dirt cheap cards that play the same game. It's a huge Damn. novelty, it's kinda cool, but there's not much of a reason to use this now, or to ever use the e-reader even when it was new. The neatest thing it did though, was add new levels to Mario Advance 4. They designed oh. dozens of brand new levels, some that incorporated elements from games like Mario 2 or Mario World, these are crazy. Now you could track down all those special level cards, or you could just download Mario Advance 4 on the Wii U and blam all the e-reader levels are unlocked, that's nice. Some GameCube games yeah. supported the e-reader, which you'd use by linking up the Game Boy Advance with this cable. You could actually link your GBA with a bunch of games to unlock things or play certain mini games, and sometimes it was recommended like with Four Swords Adventures or Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles. The GameCube also had the Game Boy Player, which allowed to play all Game Boy games on the TV. You see, there was a god, and it was Nintendo in 2003 when they released this thing. But out of all Game Boy Advance accessories or models, they all pale in comparison 
to the Visteon Dockable Entertainment featuring Game Boy Advance. An entertainment system for vehicles that could also play Game Boy Advance games with a wireless controller. This is by far the most unique really? and mind-blowing Game Boy Advance model of all time that's sure to put anybody who comes in contact with it into a state of shock and awe. Scott. Oh shit, it's a Game Boy. <laughs> Oh God, Scott, how much did you pay for that? Scott, how much did you pay for that? No. Oh, no. Oh, there are days I worry about Scott. There are days I really, really, really worry about Scott. Oh, anyway. Yeah, so, Scott the Waz, with his trusty Game Boy Advance SP and now his Game Boy his top mounted Game Boy that Game Boy Advance that is in his vehicle. Wow. Wow, dude. I just I have no words right now. I I don't know what I, I don't know what else to say. Scott, congratulations on on you know, finding that, and I hope you didn't have to sell your soul for it, because, whew, that's got to be expensive. Anyway, so yeah, that was Scott the Waz with his Game Boy Advance Power to the Pocket video, and if you all enjoyed, and you wish to see more from uh, Mr. Waz, uh, the Wozniak, aka uh, Scotty Scotty Wozman, uh, let's, uh, feel free to check him out by clicking his name in the title of the video, and until next time, signing off, I'm Nate. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.